Welcome to day six of the retreat, also known as the last day. Um, I don't know about you, but typically when I'm on retreat, I tend to, at this point in the retreat, start to move forward into the future. And even though the practice is being here in the present, and I think that's just kind of like a normal and natural part of coming to the end of things. So um, for myself, I try to be, you know, a little patient with my future mind and just recognizing, yeah, this is what the mind does. It, tra- it time travels. So anyway, welcome, welcome here. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about um, the process of integration in practice and specifically about integral mindfulness. What does it mean to bring attention to ourselves, to others, and to the world? And, and really, uh, Christiane, in the opening uh, session, she really set me up perfectly for this talk. Thank you, Christiane. Um, when she shared that whatever happens in here happens between us, and it also happens outside. And that was uh, so perfect. I jotted that down. I was like, oh, I'm going to use that as the opening for this talk because that's exactly what I wanted to speak about today and kind of uh, unpack a bit. And when I use the term integral, um, I'm using this in a, in a kind of specific way. Um, when I was in my early 20s, uh, Emily and I, we were just started dating at the time. We were living in Raleigh, Durham, going to college together. And I dropped out of school at the time to meditate full time. Uh, fortunately for her, she finished her degree <laughs> and encouraged me to, um, to finish mine as well. But she said, hey, look, she brought this uh, Utni magazine. This, uh, and it was an ad at the back of the magazine. It says, hey, look, there's this university out in Colorado where you can meditate and get your degree. <laughs> And uh, that was such a genius move on her part because she knew exactly how to uh, get, get, <laughs> yeah, exactly. She set me up <laughs> for success. And, and I did, I went to Naropa, we moved out to Colorado together. And I was also really into going out there because one of my favorite uh, authors at the time, an integral philosopher named Ken Wilbur was living in the area and was doing some interesting stuff at the time. This was in the mid, uh, the mid aughts. And so I thought, oh, cool, maybe I could go finish my degree, meditate, and find my favorite philosopher and see if I can hang out with him or at least some of the people that are, you know, into his work, I could find them. And so indeed, that's what we did. We went out to Colorado. I I ended up meeting folks in Ken Wilber's scene and ended up uh, working for his organization and studying with him for a couple of years in person. And so uh, a lot of what I'm going to share here has kind of come from my learning and understanding both of his integral philosophy and also of my own practice and teaching of Dharma, meditation and mindfulness. Um, And one thing I learned from Ken that I, I so appreciate is that he kind of describes evolution as a process of both differentiating, that is making distinctions, things kind of that seem to be like all one thing, we start to actually notice nuances and distinctions. They begin to differentiate. And then integration, that that evolution happens through this process of differentiation and then integration, differentiation, integration. A couple of uh, examples of this, one is biological development, the development of our own organism. Currently, we have something like 30 trillion cells in our bodies, but we all started as a single cell. (laughs) We all started as a zygote. And then because of this amazing uh, software that runs on our DNA, software that writes its own hardware, uh, we began to, uh, these cells began to, to differentiate, to divide, and then to become different kinds of cells. And some of the cells group together into different kinds of tissues. And those tissues form organs and the organs form systems. And you get this process all the way up from the bottom of differentiating and then coming together, differentiating and then coming together. 
And although I had only finished a differential calculus by the time I dropped out of school in order to meditate full time, I also understand that in calculus, there's a similar process of differential calculus and then integral calculus. That these things, even some of our ideas, the way they evolve, seem to follow a similar kind of trend. So today I wanna talk about the differentiation of mindfulness and the integration of it in our own experience. And here to, to, to differentiate to kind of make distinctions, I'd like to refer to something that Ken Wilber uh, in his own writing talks about as the big three, three big perspectives that we tend to take as human beings. In fact, they're so deeply embedded in our our way of seeing that sometimes we don't even notice that they're at the very root of our grammar uh, in in many languages. And here's how Ken Wilber describes it in a book called The Religion of Tomorrow. Of these three, the first, second, and third person. He says, the first person refers to the person who is speaking. In this case, it's I or me. The second person refers to the person being spoken to, you or thou, although we don't typically use thou these days. And a you plus an I is a we. So sometimes this view, he says, is referred to as you, we, or just we. And the third person refers to the person or thing being spoken of, an objective he or him, she, her, they, them, or simply it or its. And Emily mentioned these big three perspectives in the opening of the talk as well, when she talked about Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Um, Here, the Buddha could also refer to our own Buddha nature, our own sense of subjectivity, the nature of consciousness. Sangha here refers to the community of people putting into practice these practices of mindfulness of meditation, of contemplation. And Dharma refers to the, to the teachings, to the objective teachings, the things that were written down that we're still referring to 2,500 years later, these, these uh, objects, these its. And, and again, these perspectives are deeply embedded in our own language. If you ever wanna know what perspective you're taking, just listen to your language. Just listen to the words you're using. It'll point you right to where you're looking from. When we're speaking an I language, we're talking from the first person, which is another way of putting the first person is our subjective experience, what we are experiencing, what we're sensing. When we're speaking about someone else or we're speaking about us, here we're referring to the second person. And this is what we could call the intersubjective perspective culture, if you like. And then the third person is the objective or interobjective perspective. When we're taking a perspective where we're stepping outside and looking at things from the outside. And this is one of the sort of the geniuses, I guess, in one way of the Western enlightenment, this development, this high, highly developed third person science, these objective sciences that emerge. Of course, the third person objective perspective always existed, but here we see a kind of extreme version of it in the modern world. We've really learned how to study empirically, to measure, to uh, deepen into these amazing theories, which have led to some incredible technologies that as far as we know, have never existed before. So these three perspectives I wanna talk about and I wanna see what it looks like if we were to bring mindfulness to each of these domains, to differentiate mindfulness and to say, it's not just something that happens in our first person experience, although that is a lot of what we focus on in the practice. But this retreat, it's, it's a relational mindfulness retreat, right? So we're intentionally in the very title of the retreat and in the subtitle, 
you know, being with all that is, uh, we're intentionally pointing to something that goes beyond our mere subjective experience. Because although in one real sense, our, our subjective experience is the only thing we will ever notice, the only thing we can ever notice is directly in our own sensory experience through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking. It's also true that this isn't the only thing that's actually happening in the reality. <laughs> you know, to, to believe otherwise is what some philosophers call solipsism, um, where you just completely think you are the only thing that's happening. That's a dangerous perspective, actually. Um, you also, we could call that extreme narcissism. And that's not what this practice is about. It's not a practice of narcissism, of just becoming absorbed in our own experience and thinking that this is all that matters. But it is important. Uh, our experience does matter. And it, it matters because, as Christian pointed out, our experience is interconnected with each other's experience and with the world. And actually, this isn't some kind of new understanding, right? Uh, many have talked about the web of life. Um, in fact, if we take this text, which we've been exploring on the retreat, the Satipatthana Sutta, and we look back at the text and explore, it's very interesting because after that refrain on the mindfulness of breathing that Emily mentioned, breathing in long, we know I breathe in long, breathing out long, we know I breathe out long, breathing in short, I know I breathe in short, and so forth. Right after that, the instructions continue. In this way, in regard to the body, he abides contemplating the body internally, or he abides contemplating the body externally, or he abides contemplating the body both internally and externally. And what's interesting, if you read the Satipatthana, as I was doing this morning in pre preparation for this talk, you actually see that this same refrain of contemplating internally, externally, both internally and externally, it applies to each of the progressive foundations of mindfulness. It's one of the most repeated phrases in the entire text. And what's so interesting is that according to Bhikkhu Analyo, who's a monk and scholar of early Buddhism, who completed his um, PhD thesis on this very text, the Satipatthana Sutta, which then became a popular Dharma book um, that's called Satipatthana, the direct path to realization. There are actually a number of different modern interpretations of what this phrase internal and external means. Um, there's one interpretation that says that this is the inside and the outside of the body is what's referred to here. Others claim that this is the relative and ultimate truth, the internal and the external. But he actually concludes that in summary, although alternative ways of understanding internal and external satipatthana have their practical value, to understand internal as referring to oneself and external as referring to others offers a practicable form of contemplation, which can moreover claim support from the discourses, the Abhidhamma and the commentaries, basically all of the kind of Buddhist texts. He's saying this is like consistent with the rest of the the system of, of texts and written documents. In the end, he writes, whichever interpretation one may adopt, once contemplation is practiced both internally and externally, it entails a shift towards a comprehensive type of practice. At this stage, even the boundary between I and other or internal and external is left behind leading to a comprehensive vision of phenomena as such, independent of any sense of ownership. So as I got more into working with social meditation, my teacher Kenneth Folk in 
2010, started to teach social noting. And I'd only done this practice uh, internally by myself before, um, following the traditional instructions of the Burmese monk Mahasi Sayadaw. And in that practice, you close your eyes and you start to notice what you're sensing. And you use a mental label, usually a simple word or two, to describe your experience. There's seeing, thinking, nervousness, allowing, breathing. When I started to do this out loud with Kenneth and then later with uh, students and friends of mine, what I was surprised by was to find that all of this internal mindfulness that I'd been developing through my own practice, through months and months of silent meditation retreat, through hours and hours of sitting and contemplating the changing flow of body sensations, emotions, and thoughts, that actually I suddenly became aware for almost for the first time of what was actually happening in other people's first person experience as well. And, and that awareness in real time of being able to actually sense not only what I was experiencing, but what others were experiencing, that this opened up a whole new realm of practice for me. And it was one that I had been sorely missing. And to me, this extended mindfulness from the first person subjective experience into as a practice, as a formal practice, into the interpersonal, the intersubjective field of knowing. And suddenly I became more aware of what people around me were experiencing. Uh, suddenly I wasn't just locked into my own experience. And, and, and many people report the opposite actually through doing social meditation, that no longer do they find that they get lost immediately in other people's experience, but rather suddenly they become aware, oh, I'm getting lost in other people's experience. How can I be aware both of myself, both internally, and externally. And ultimately, I think this practice, when we take it deep enough, it actually brings us beyond the duality or the separation between the two, self and other. We start to catch glimpses of this deep reality, which isn't um, fixated anywhere, is not owned by anyone. So I'm not going to talk a lot about um, really the mindfulness of self perspective, because I think um, we've already done a really good job of that together here on the retreat. And frankly, um, that's what most of the literature is already about. So all of you, I think, already have a really good uh, firm understanding of the first person. Instead, I want to focus a bit more on the second person and the third person, and especially on how we experience freedom in these different ways. Um, Christian mentioned freedom as being one of the results of practice. And what does that freedom look like if we begin to extend freedom beyond ourselves? If we begin to take this well-trained attention and we can um, apply it to different domains of life. So let me talk a little bit now about the, what it's like to become mindful of the world. I've talked a little bit with social meditation about the experience of become mindful of others. And I think mindfulness of the world uh, or mindfulness of the objective, uh, the third person, this is an interesting idea because it's not like we can look out into our experience and see the objective the objective. We, we, we do, we see objects, we see things, but there's seeing, but there's also an object. Both of these perspectives are true. Even Buddhist psychology acknowledges the distinction here. They don't say that it's all just seeing. Well, some schools do, but let's forget, let's forget those guys. <laughs> um, uh, but really, we, n- none of us really think there aren't any, you know, things out there. We act as if that's true, right? And And here, I think it's uh, mindfulness of the world means for me becoming aware that we're embedded within systems. We're embedded within governmental systems. 
We're embedded within economic systems. We're embedded within technological systems. The technological systems right now that we're embedded in are enabling this very retreat to happen, are enabling us to connect with each other despite the fact that we're in a pandemic that's global in scope. And we're also, and most importantly, we're embedded in physical and biological systems. So this embeddedness means we are actually, from the third person perspective, we are quite small. From the first person's perspective, this is all that is, this experience. There's, this is it. But from the third person perspective, we're like this tiny little grain of sand in a great cosmos. And both perspectives are true. The universe both arises as our subjective experience and it arises as the universe, the objective reality that um, scientists over the last few hundred years have studied in ways that had never happened before. Now, how is it that we can apply mindfulness though to these systems? Well, one, we have to know that they exist first. Um, and so to me, that actually means studying systems. Um, when I went to Naropa, one of the first classes I took was on systems theory, systems thinking. And it was so cool. There's so many things I just, I didn't know about how systems work. And when systems get under pressure, what can happen to a system, how it can transform. Sometimes when there's enough pressure in a system, it actually will completely reconfigure itself into some new way of doing things. Or sometimes systems collapse and they break down. We uh, often, I think, because we're embedded in these systems, we assume that they're going to continue on forever, you know, in the same way that we sometimes assume that we <laughs> are going to continue on forever. Uh, we take for granted their impermanence. And these systems are impermanent in the same way that our experience is impermanent. Again, impermanence is a universal truth, one that extends beyond any one of these perspectives. For myself, I've also found, uh, I've learned a lot about systems by creating systems, you know, and every one of us has to do this as modern human beings, right? Like um, we have to have systems in our home just to function. Certainly if you have a family, you've got to figure out, okay, where does the mail go? Where does the trash go? Who's taking it out? Who's responsible for what? You know, we end up creating these, um, these ways of working that are explicit, you know, we say, oh, I am responsible for the trash. Like I'm the trash person, you know, and I'll take out the trash every Friday, every Friday. Why every Friday? Well, because there's a system out there, right? <laughs> the, our, our local trash system operates, you know, they, they go every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to pick up trash. They can't pick it all up in one day because they don't have enough trucks. <laughs> so they have a system and I am embedded in their system. I have to bring the trash out on Friday. Systems within systems. And these systems influence our experience. They influence our behavior. And when we're not aware of them, they influence us in invisible ways where we actually lose our agency. We lose our ability to respond to those systems. We're just like a cog in the machine. So to me, developing mindfulness of the world means developing the capacity to engage consciously with the systems that we are embedded within. And this is really important because not all of these systems are great, right? I mean, some of these systems really don't take into account certain people or organisms perspective. Some systems are unaware of certain things. And because of that, they, they, they can wreak tremendous damage. So becoming aware of systems to me, uh, becoming mindful of how we are embedded in, in the objective world and seeing that, you know, there are limits to these systems. There's limits to the physical and biological systems that we're in, you know, just because we want to have unlimited growth doesn't mean we will be able to, right? Um, we're, I think we're all kind of learning that as a human family, slowly, gradually, hopefully more quickly soon, um, that these systems have limits. And that our practice isn't independent from the limits of the system. If any of these biological or physical systems that support life 
heart begin to shake or crumble, which we're starting to see, then we won't be able to practice anymore. We won't be, have the leisure to practice. We won't have the security to spend time contemplating our own existence. It, our mindfulness won't, our personal mindfulness will not be enough in order to continue on this path. So this is all interconnected. It's interwoven reality. Now, I don't mean to say that we all have to go out and be responsible for all of the big systems of the world, of course. <laughs> um, to me, practicing mindfulness of the world and mindfulness with each other, it, it means really bringing awareness and attention to the things that we're already connected to and to the work that we're already doing. Oftentimes, it doesn't mean that we have to um, single-handedly, you know, uh, save the world. And nor could we. So let, let me talk a little bit about freedom here. Um, freedom. It's a beautiful quote that Christian mentioned earlier about freedom from the Buddha. Just as in the great ocean, there is but one taste, the taste of salt. So in this teaching and discipline, there is but one taste, the taste of freedom. So let me talk first about the way that we experience freedom in our first person experience from the I perspective. And here I love Jack Kornfield's description of this in, a, in an article called Enlightenments where he talks about the different ways that enlightenment manifests. He says, when you actually experience consciousness free of identification with changing conditions, liberated from greed and hate, you find it multifaceted, like a mandala or a jewel, a crystal with many sides. Through one facet, the enlightened heart shines as luminous clarity through another as perfect peace, through another as boundless compassion. Time consciousness is timeless, ever present, completely empty and full of all things. And I love this description because it points to the experience of freedom in the first person as boundlessness, as unqualifiable emptiness, as that which cannot be captured in words. As the Zen teacher Ross Boletaire says, the inexpressible cannot be captured in words. Rather, it's expressed as words. And that points to what Jack was describing as the fullness of all things. Reality somehow, when we really get to know it well, it appears to be not fixed. It's constantly changing. There's no place that we can hang our hat in any final way. Um, Orrin mentioned the corelessness of existence. And yet, even as that's true, it continues to manifest. It continues to arise. We continue to wake up every single morning to a new day uh, until, <laughs> of course, we don't. Uh, and then we don't know really what happens. <laughs> Who knows? But this freedom uh, in the first person experience is experienced as a tremendous openness, fluidity, and okayness with the changing conditions of life. It is, and it points us to a happiness which is independent of conditions. Like even if the world were ending, there's some part of us that could be okay because we know this is the way it is. It's not like I was gonna get out of this alive anyway. <laughs> so why should I be more scared of the collapse of civilization as I am the death of my own self? I mean, there's some part of us that actually can be free, 
even in the midst of the most horrific conditions. And many of the great masters of the 20th century and, and, and before have pointed to this. Thich Nhat Hanh, the Dalai Lama, some of the greatest Buddhist teachers of our time, they went through the most horrendous conditions and they still maintained connection with this profound freedom. Now, what does freedom look like in the second person, intersubjectively? What is it like to be free together? Right? Think about your own experience. What is it like when you're with other people and you feel free? This is another quote from Ken Wilber in his book, The Religion of Tomorrow. He says, one of the most astonishing, miraculous, stunning, and mysterious events in the entire cosmos is that one being let's say a human in this example, can actually reach a mutual understanding with another human being, that they can look each other in the eye and say, I understand what you mean. So for me, freedom in the second person, it's experienced as mutuality, as a mutual understanding, as a sense of interconnection, of fondness, of care, of generosity, of community. And I think in the early Buddhist teachings, you see some really beautiful practices and teachings around this freedom in the second person through the teachings of the Brahma Viharas, the, the four qualities of open-heartedness that Christian mentioned yesterday, through loving kindness or loving awareness, through compassion, through, through empathetic joy and through equanimity. And then what does freedom look like in the third person? What is it like to bring freedom into the third person? Bhikkhu Bodhi in, a, in an article called The Taste of Freedom, Bhikkhu Bodhi is a, a scholar monk who translated much of the early Buddhist um, canon, the, the early texts. And he's also deeply uh, engaged with social issues. He wrote, the clarion call of our present age is without doubt the call for freedom. Perhaps at no time in the past history of mankind, so much at the present has, has the cry for freedom sounded so widely and so urgently. Perhaps never before has it penetrated so deeply into the fabric of human existence. I'm very grateful right now to be embedded in a democratic form of government. And I know that's potentially not true for everyone who's here listening to this. Um, and, and I'm not going to say that like, this is the best, superior, most awesome form of government ever. I mean, surely it is not, it's imperfect. Um, and, we're, and we're discovering that again and again with each new generation, we have to re-understand and take responsibility for, for, the, for these governmental systems that we participate in. Um, but one of the core functions and purposes of democracy is to provide freedom to the individual, for the, for the individual's voices to be heard and to be integrated into these systems. So for me, part of what freedom in the third person looks like, it looks like justice. As Dr. Cornell West says, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. And if you remember what Deepama said, Oren shared that beautiful quote, when you're fully loving, aren't you also mindful? When you are mindful, is this not also the essence of love? So if there really is no fundamental distinction in the timeless crystal of conscious awareness between mindfulness and love, then we could very easily take what Dr. Cornell West said, and we could say, never forget that justice is what mindfulness looks like in public. And there, there is a very strong critique of modern mindfulness that I think is very much worth us understanding and integrating into our own 
life and practice and teaching, since many of us here are training as teachers, which is that if we only limit our mindfulness to our first person experience, to just us, our experience, and we participate in systems that are causing true harm, and we sort of are teaching people to just be okay with whatever they experience, which is actually true. That is the, that is the mindfulness in the first person. That's, that is the practice. But that is not mindfulness in the third person. It's not to just be okay with whatever you see. Mindfulness in the third person means see and understand how these systems work and, and, and use your own agency, use your own choice making to make different kinds of choices that tend to lean, lead these systems to greater justice, to greater fairness, to more accessibility, to less prejudice, and ultimately to more responsive systems, systems that respond to human beings and systems that respond to the needs of the earth. Because these systems are not just about human beings, They're about the entire community of beings, the entire physical world upon which all of this community rests. We cannot debase that without debasing ourselves. And we are not truly free until all beings everywhere are free. And the reason for that is because the first, second, and third person go together. They are integrated in reality. We can talk about them as being distinct, but I do that to point out the ways in which we might not see the differences yet. And and, and there we need to make distinctions. But once we do see the differences and we do break uh, and we do start to kind of extend our awareness from where we are free to where we aren't free, then eventually there's just freedom. And freedom can be experienced and expressed in all of these different ways. And that to me is what really is most important, this fundamental freedom.